Last night on my orders, America's armed forces began strikes against ISIL targets in Syria. America, 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 The people we are fighting today, we funded. Waging war on corruption. It's Alex Jones coming to you live from the front lines of the info war. ISIS has grabbed up from the US, from the Saudis, from the Qataris, weapons by the truckload. And we are now forced to fight against our own weapons. And this body wants to throw more weapons into the mix. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It's December 18th, 2014, and that's exactly right. America, yeah, where we let other countries tell us how to make our movies. And not only do we let them tell us how to make our movies, like Iron Man 3 or Red Dawn, now they say, we don't want you to air this movie, we just won't air it. And now we have the article, Paramount Cancels Alamo Draft House's Team America Screening. Reportedly, Paramount Pictures has decided not to let the theater chain show the movie at all. Alamo Drafthouse sent a message telling their customers that the screening would not take place due to circumstances beyond their control. See, what had happened was that Seth Rogen and Jane Franco, they made this little movie called The Interview, in which they go in to assassinate Kim Jong-un, and it's my understanding there's some type of orgy scene in it. I wouldn't know because the movie's not supposed to be released. Because that's what happens here in America. We have so much freedom, we let foreign entities show us how to make our movies and also how to promote them or play them at all. You guys recall Iron Man 3 and also Red Dawn. They got censored and remade because the Chinese audience didn't like them as they are. Now Kim Jong-un and his camp supposedly are threatening hack attacks, or I guess already had hack attacks, here in the States because of a movie. Uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. That's like saying the innocence of Muslims caused the Benghazi attacks. I don't buy that one bit. But for more on how this hack attack may not be all that it seems, here's Paul Joseph Watson. The U.S. government has stridently asserted that North Korea was almost certainly responsible for the Sony hack, with no evidence whatsoever. Look at this New York Times headline. U.S. said to find North Korea ordered cyber attack on Sony. American officials have concluded that North Korea was centrally involved in the hacking of Sony Pictures computers. Now, if we actually had a real media in the United States, the headline would be something like, no evidence backs up U.S. claim that North Korea ordered cyber attack on Sony. But because this is the New York Times, which is basically a press release outlet for the White House, we get a headline like this. And it's actually not until halfway down the article that we read, it is not clear how the United States determined that Mr. Kim's government had played a central role in the Sony attacks. In other words, there's no evidence whatsoever to back up this claim. As Wired News' Kim Zeta reports, the evidence that North Korea hacked Sony is flimsy. Sony and the FBI have announced that they've found no evidence so far to tie North Korea to the attack. In fact, the only evidence that really does indicate anything is that this hack attack on Sony Pictures was an inside job. As TMZ reports, the people at Sony who are investigating believe the hackers had intimate knowledge of mail systems and their configurations. They also believe the hackers have knowledge of the internal media distribution systems and the internal IT systems, including human resources and payroll. And they're suggesting that there could be a link between the huge number of Sony layoffs that have taken place recently and an aggrieved employee that could have been responsible for this hack. The FBI also suspects that the hack was the work of a disgruntled worker 
that even though the Guardians of Peace group has taken responsibility for breaking into Sony's servers, the group had to have had help from someone familiar with the infrastructure. And after Sony announced yesterday that it would pull the movie The Interview from all cinemas, Paramount followed suit by announcing that Team America, which of course also insults North Korea, would be pulled from theatres nationwide. But amidst the myriad of accusations and theories as to who is responsible for this hack, be it North Korea or some kind of inside job by a disgruntled employee, here's what they're not telling you. The two previous cyber attacks that caused anywhere near the alarm created by this Sony hack were done by the US government. When Alex Jones accused the United States of being behind the Stuxnet virus attack back in 2010 in order to grease the skids for draconian cyber security measures, he was labelled a conspiracy theorist. Two years later, it emerged that the US and Israel were almost certainly responsible for the attack. And again, we saw the same thing with the flame virus aimed at targeting Iran's nuclear program. It was a conspiracy theory to blame this on the United States and Israel. Lo and behold, the Washington Post subsequently reported US Israel developed flame computer virus to slow Iranian nuclear efforts. But of course, at the time, the blame was solely pinned on foreign actors like Russia, just as it is being pinned on North Korea now with the Sony hack. In order to justify draconian cybersecurity measures like the ones that Joe Lieberman called for in giving the White House the same power as China to censor and shut down the internet. So what do we see now with the Obama administration saying that North Korea is responsible with no evidence whatsoever that this is a national security matter and that it reiterates the fact that Congress should pass the cyber security bill. So now we see this being exploited. Politicians respond to Sony hack, call for cyber security bill. Cyber security legislation that has repeatedly stalled in Congress is now looking set to get the green light in the aftermath of this Sony hack. John McCain said in a statement, Congress as a whole must also address these issues and finally pass long overdue comprehensive cybersecurity legislation. And just by coincidence, Obama State Department official Catherine Novelli was meeting with China's internet censorship czar. This is the guy overseeing the Great Firewall of China, the infamous government censorship program over the entire web. She was meeting with him at an event in Washington, urging cooperation on cybersecurity between the United States and China. While, of course, the Obama administration moves to reclassify the internet under the Telecommunications Act, making it susceptible to FCC control, greasing the skids for government oversight and regulation of the web. So isn't it convenient that right at the time the cybersecurity legislation is stalled in Congress, as the Obama administration shows its desperation to regulate the internet, now we have this convenient Sony hack that can be used to grease the skids for tightened control. But what do you think? Am I a conspiracy theorist for even daring to suggest this premise? Just as I was labelled a conspiracy theorist for saying the US was behind Stuxnet and Flame, which later proved to be the case, or do you think that this is the work of a disgruntled employee, the work of a foreign actor like North Korea, or is a wider conspiracy afoot? Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm Paul Joseph Watson reporting for Infowars.com. Hans Briggs! Oh no! Oh, hello! Great to see you again, Hans! Cuba move comes as Russia tries to revive ties to Havana. President Obama's surprise economic and diplomatic opening to Cuba Wednesday comes at a time when Vladimir Putin's Russia has been trying to revive Moscow's once close ties to the Castro regime, a longtime ally of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Mr. Putin has received support from the Castro regime in Russia's skirmishes with Ukraine this year. 
But with Russia's economy cratering this week, Cuba appears to be looking elsewhere for more stable economic support, experts say. So we see Russia, they're making friends with Cuba, they're making friends with China, going all around the world, doing the best they can to build up their friends. While us here in the U.S., we're doing everything we can to distance people, to make them mad, to bomb their countries, to tap their diplomats' phones, and so forth. So, you know, I'm not at all happy that uh, Russia is gaining a foothold of the place in the world, but here in the United States, we're not doing anything to really stop them. The only thing we're doing is supposedly poking the bear, so to speak. So let's talk about somebody poking the First Amendment. It's happening in Tennessee. Tennessee City outlaws the First Amendment. In South Pittsburgh, Tennessee, the city council recently voted 4-1 to one to approve an all-inclusive social networking policy aimed at discouraging criticism of the government. It outlaws the exercise of the First Amendment for all city elected representatives, appointed board members, employees, volunteers even, vendors, contractors, and anyone else associated with the town in any official capacity to use social networks. So, you know, yes, we've seen many people come out with controversial statements. Uh, the guy up in Washington, the deputy, he said, we need these MRAPs and these military vehicles to combat the, uh, the constitutionalists, the people with all the guns. We'll talk more about that here in a little bit. And other controversial statements made all around the country as well. So I understand why they want to have a uh, somewhat of a policy, but to say that we're just going to pretty much blacklist your free speech because you work for our city, uh, that's taking it a bridge too far. This city definitely needs to rethink their policy and stop telling their employees, uh, especially the volunteers. I cannot believe they have volunteers that you cannot use social media without their consent. Completely ridiculous. And something else is completely ridiculous. California and the paramilitary training that's going on out there. And it says, California Highway Patrol describes itself as a paramilitary organization. And this is a great article by Paul Joseph Watson, but let's hit the bullet points. Let's take a look at the sections, the, uh, the screenshots here. It says, is this job for you? Are you willing to work in a paramilitary organization operating under structured, train, uh, structured chain of command? So that's what they're telling you right there. You know, this is a paramilitary organization. You know, do you have all the skills? Do you have what it takes? It's not, you know, uh, the blue uniforms and walking around and buying the kids ice cream cones. No, are you ready to do whatever it takes? Are you ready to use military tactics on people in your own neighborhood? Let's continue here. California Highway Patrol is often described as paramilitary department. And they said, yes, that's true. Okay, and also going down, it says, recruiting America's best to be California's finest. Former military personnel easily fit into CHP's workforce and adapt well to our paramilitary work environment. And it says, you can use your former military skills to help promote, promote you through the CHP ranks. And this is what we talk about, these uh, military mindsets. The shoot first, ask questions later. You know, if you see one guy shooting from a bus, you light up the entire bus and not try to take out just that one guy. These are the kind of taxes that we see. And also California, as well as many other states, have uh, some pretty shady dealings, dealing with their police departments and also their sheriff's departments. You guys recall not too long ago, long ago the uh, Christopher Dorner situation in which uh, they were looking for, you know, a, a dark-skinned male driving, a, it was a white truck or something like that. But regardless, they shot at a blue truck occupied by two white women. And this is just a complete lunacy. We were looking for this guy that doesn't look anything like these women. We're looking for a single guy driving a different colored car. So let's just shoot whatever car is out here. And also, uh, Christopher Dorner, let's burn that mother effort down. You guys recall that? So Christopher Dorner is supposedly in the cabin, and he has some hostages, and you can hear the guys on the radio, the police, the sheriffs, whoever they were, saying, get the gas, get the gas, burn the gas, burn that mother effer down. And then they come out on mainstream media, and they say, talking to the FBI guy, well, what do you make of this? What do you make of these, uh, these claims that this guy made? He said, well, I'm not exactly sure what context they were talking about. Now, let's talk about this a little more in depth. If you and I, viewer, were having a conversation that happens to be recorded by the police, and we say, hey, let's get some gas and burn that mother effer down. And 10 minutes later, the place is burning to the ground. We're going to be sitting in an interrogation room asking, uh, being asked why we had this conversation. And then the sheriff's department comes out and they say, uh, you know, what, what's going on? This is what the press asked. And what's going on with these quotes of your officers on the radio? And, he's, and the chief or uh, the sheriff, whoever he was, he said, well, a flashbang grenade is commonly referred to as a burner. Okay, you can call it uh, a rainbow if you want to, but that doesn't explain get the gas, burn the gas, and burn the mother effer down. And these are the type of paramilitary tactics that very much concern me when we talk about our neighborhood law enforcement. And that's what we're going to be talking about more coming up after this break with Darren McBreen. 
talking about the shenanigans of the Sheriff's Department.